Hey everyone, so this video is about the unfortunate topic of stress. Um, before I get started, please do know that of all of the videos in Unit 4, this one probably has the most amount of videos and articles in the description below, so please check out some of the elements related to stress, coping, uh, some of those related to the physiological changes during stress and, and things like that, including how stress actually changes the aging process. So um, just to get started, let's just be clear. Stress is not the enemy. Stress is a biological necessity. Without stress, animals would not be able to become afraid or angry, uh, and therefore they would not be able to have fight or flight and be able to possibly you know, fight for their lives or run for their lives. Uh, so while we often view stress as the problem, stress is not really the issue. It's the number of stressors, the size of the stressors, our ability to manage them, cope with them, handle them, the intensity of them, the duration of them. And that's definitely one of the biggest issues related to humans. Um, our bodies and brain were absolutely uh, designed to handle stress, but only the way that stress has evolved up until recently. For most of history and with all other animals, Stress was about in that moment and due to very specific certain things. However, in our lives, stress is no longer about life and death. Stress is no longer about survival. Stress is about money problems and family problems and grade problems and economic, excuse me, economic problems and political problems and, and social problems and, 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 and you know, all the things that go on in your life with money and friends and family and, and interpersonal relationships. It takes its toll. That was not what stress was designed for. Stress was designed to basically wade you through a moment. Stress was the equivalent of a rainy day fund in response to a crisis. Stress wasn't meant to be unemployment benefits that may have to force you for several months on end to survive. That's what's hurting humans. My, your, my cat, your dogs, uh, other animals, they stress when there is an emergency. The rest of the time, they don't stress. That's how stress was designed. In humans, however, we can't find the off button. There's always something. There's always something else. And when there isn't that thing, there's always another thing waiting to happen. That is not what our bodies were mechanically designed to do to handle stress. And it essentially is killing us. Not directly, but it's taking its toll. Physically, emotionally, behaviorally, psychologically, it is absolutely taking its toll. I have probably now successfully just made you stressed, having talked about how stressed out life is. So, let's talk about some terminology. A stressor is anything that causes stress. And you're like, well, duh, that makes perfect sense. But I do want to point out that that stressor does not have to be a life or death stress. It can be something like money problems, family problems, uh, relationship problems. However, a stressor can also be a good thing such as an opportunity that's going to take a lot of time, work, and effort, that's a stressor. Going to the gym while you're trying to get healthier, but you're lifting weights and you're putting exertion on your body, that's a stressor. Watching a scary movie by choice is entertaining, but that's a stressor. Also, notice it says stressors real or imaginary. We are the only animal that often stresses about things that might never happen at all. My cat, if he were to run out of food or if he were to see a stranger, he'll stress. However, humans often stress over things that may never even happen at all, such as, oh my God, what if I get caught? And then you never get caught. Or, oh my God, what if I don't get in? And then you do get in. Or, oh my God, what if I never get the job? And you do get the job. But the stress was real. The actual event that you made up in your head was imaginary, but the stress of it was real. So stress is pretty much anything that causes an inability to cope because of anxiety that then provokes other behavior thoughts, physical changes, and behavioral changes. So uh, there are essentially two types of stressors, if you had to put them into two basic categories. Distress is the negative stress associated with the negative crap that happens in your life. The money problems. The family problems the relationship problems, the social problems, the interpersonal relationship problems, the co-worker problems, okay, the health problems, many of which were probably caused by stress in the first place. Those are called distressors. However, eustress 
are what we often call positive stress, but it still counts as stress. When you go to the gym, that's you stress. You want to go to the gym. You are encouraged by the gym. You willingly choose the gym, but it's you stress. If you have a passion for something like a sport or a chorus or theater, that's you stress, but it still takes its toll on your body. From the body's perspective, stress is stress. doesn't make any difference if you're running from a bear or running on a treadmill. It's still the same stress. But in your mind, you know the difference. That's eustress. Eustress is, you know, riding a roller coaster, watching a scary movie. That's eustress. You know, t- you know taking on challenges, doing risk-seeking behavior. Okay? The thrill of it all. That's eustress. It still harms the body just because, like, it doesn't matter. You know, if you're driving your car the hospital to get better, or if you're driving your car, you know, just down the street to visit your friend, it doesn't matter that one of those might be more critically important to the other. Both of them put miles on your car. So the same thing is true of your body when it comes to stress, eustress or distress. Hassles are the everyday little annoyances that happen to all of us all the time. However, they don't become a problem unless you make them a problem. Hassles in themselves are harmless. But if you have ever heard the expression of making mountains out of molehills or turning molehills into mountains, that is the way that a hassle can hurt you. If somebody cuts you off on the way to work, if nobody's car got hit, and in the grand scheme of things, the only thing that mattered was you got a little butt hurt, let it go. But some people can't, and it makes them angry. And then it affects them at work. Then it affects them with their coworkers. Then it affects their performance at work. And they just internalize it and it turns into a whole thing. That's when you turn to hassle into something more powerful. Okay? Hassles happen all the time. They are not things to which you should be spending time on. But some of you know people that the smallest little things, and we all we all have instances where we are, or where we do this, but some people definitely are more prone to it than others. Something sets them off, something small little thing, you're like, it's not that big of a deal, but it doesn't matter, they've already gone into what's called catastrophe mode. Then, the term catharsis. Anything that is cathartic is something you do purposefully to try to burn off and release stress. So, if you go to the gym... The, yes, you are putting stress on your body, but you're also releasing a lot of emotional and psychological stress. That's cathartic. If you play video games like I do, if you write, I like to write, listen to music, you go for a run, maybe you do yoga, you know, maybe you uh, paint, you know, whatever it is, you play guitar, you do things that help. Everybody needs coping mechanisms that help. Catharsis or being cathartic or anything that helps with that. Uh, obviously when you are under stress, that is fight or flight. Again, it doesn't matter if you're running on a treadmill by choice. It doesn't matter if you're running from a bear. It doesn't matter if you're fleeing an attacker or getting ready to have consensual sex with your partner. It doesn't matter if you're watching a scary movie or you're in a real life horror film in the woods getting ready to get slashed to death. It doesn't matter if it's money problems or family problems or grade problems. It doesn't matter Fight or flight, from the body's perspective, is fight or flight, period. So what happens? Well, we've already talked about some of this, but it's worth review, and then some of it is new. One, your sympathetic nervous system triggers fight or flight, and two of the things that your um, your neurotransmitters are going to immediately engage is epinephrine and norepinephrine. Remember, they are responsible for increasing arousal, alertness, and attention, and awareness of your, you and your surroundings. The endocrine system um, releases a bunch of things from your adrenal glands. It releases adrenaline. It releases noradrenaline. uh, It releases something called creatine for muscle repair because it assumes your body's going to go through damage and needs to be repaired. Uh, It's going to also release, um, it's going to tell your liver to release uh, glucose because it assumes you're going to need sugar. And then the one that we care about um, for the purposes of this unit area is it's also going to do cortisol. Cortisol, or um, or glucocorticoid, is a fatty 
compound. It's often referred to as the stress hormone. It is a fatty substance that's designed to give your body super energy, super strength, and super endurance in the face of what it assumes to be a threat. Whether or not you need all of that or not doesn't matter. Cortisol just blindly dumps into your bloodstream when you're under stress. Doesn't matter what the stress is. Cortisol is great to help you endure the stress. The problem, however, with cortisol is if you are stressed out a lot and all the time, cortisol levels basically just keep pounding and bathing into your bloodstream like crazy and you never get the off switch. And then because it is a fatty compound, it causes often um, a collection of plaque in the arteries, which is why one of the most common factors and still the number one cause of death in America is cardiovascular death because cortisol is linked to things such as high blood pressure, uh, embolisms, strokes, heart attacks, and other cardiac events. Um, also, cortisol tends to have cause what we call stress weight. You know, normally your body gains weight proportionally, but stress weight often packs itself into your midsection, um, your, your love handles, your thighs, and your butt. And that's stress weight. And that can be very difficult to get rid of because of the cortisol levels. Uh, as you can imagine, it immediately triggers everything we talked about in fight or flight in previous videos. Remember, it's going to increase muscles and then it's going to increase, regardless of it, if you actually need physical strength, it doesn't matter. It could be an argument with like, somebody, it doesn't matter. Uh, the, the muscles will activate. And then again, cardiovascular breathing, heart rate, pupil dilation, sweating, muscle strength, sugar production, adrenal production. However, remember, digestion shuts down, excretion shuts down. That's why many people that are under lots and lots of stress and many people that have lots of anxiety disorders and other anxiety-related concerns often have a lot of issues with their appetite and digestion and things such as diarrhea, irritable bowel syndrome, um, uh, constipation, um, you know, things like that, bladder-related issues, because it's just tanking. It's tanking those systems hardcore on top of doing damage to your heart and things of that nature. That brings us to Hans Selye. Uh, his theory is known as general adaptation syndrome, uh, or GAS. I've never heard it called GAS, but go for it. Uh, general adaptation sy syndrome for Hans Selye um, is the universal physical, the physiological response of the body when you go into fight or flight. This is not about psychological. That varies greatly from person to person. We're not talking about behavioral. We're not talking about cognitive. Your thinking, um, you know, some people, their thoughts, you know, they become, uh, some people, their mind becomes racing. Other people, their mind goes blank. Sometimes people, their behaviors, they become more outlandish and outgoing. Some people, they shut down and isolate. Um, you know, certainly in your brain, uh, any kind of behavioral, psychological change in the brain can change as well. In the body, though, Hans Selye pointed out that there is a general, a general way that your body adapts every single time, regardless of who you are. If you have a fight or flight system, human or otherwise, if you are under any form of stress, the body physically goes through a very predictable universal pattern of how it handles it called GAS or general adaptation syndrome. And essentially it is three uh, there are three phases, and I have them listed here. You have the alarm phase, the resistance phase, and the exhaustion phase. In the alarm phase, after there has been a stressor, you see a bear in the woods, you found out that you have another responsibility, you found out that you don't have enough money to pay the bills, one of your coworkers said something stupid, you, know, you got into a fight again, or you went to the gym, whatever the case may be, the alarm phase kicks into gear, and basically what that means is you go out of homeostasis, fight or flight kicks in, and the body immediately responds by doing the fight or flight response. It releases adrenaline, noradrenaline, cortisol. It releases all of that uh, uh, glucose. It causes you know increased musculature, sweating, heart rate, breathing, and it shuts down the stomach. It shuts down digestion, excretion. It shuts all that down. That's the alarm stage. The alarm has been sounded. You know, emergency, get the gear, let's, let's do this, let's jump into action. If the, uh, if the stressor continues beyond the initial alarm phase, because again, you can be like, oh, oh my goodness, I thought I saw something. Oh, no, it turned out not to be what I thought. Okay, no big deal, no big deal, it doesn't apply to me. So the alarm phase, you just shut it back down, you go back to homeostasis. However, if it continues, resistance, 
Your body is giving you the best it can give you. Your strength, maxed. Heart rate, maxed. Cortisol, maxed. Glucose, maxed. Okay, everything is maxed. So this is when you need to make sure the resistant, you know, that you are as resistant as possible to cope. Got to get through this. Got to get through this. Got to get through this because your resources are there. You can fight the fight. The money is there. Like uh, like from a, if you think of uh, your resources financially, the money is there. Let's spend our way through this. We can do it. However, if you reach the third stage, and for most other animals, if they reach the third stage, they're probably going to die because they're probably being attacked or they're going to starve. But in humans, usually we don't die in the exhaustion phase. The exhaustion phase says your body, it can't keep this up. It's trying, but it can't keep up the heart rate. It can't keep up the breathing. It can't keep up glucose. It can't keep, keep up cortisol. It can't keep suppressing the stomach. It can't keep suppressing the intestines. And remember, the other major thing that gets suppressed during fight or flight is your immune system because you need to fight the emergency now as opposed to the fighting the disease that you know takes time so by fighting the bear now it suppresses the immune system to re like resend energy redirect energy to your heart and send energy to your lungs and your muscles but the the immune system is the one that loses out here so by the time you reach the exhaustion phase you are starting to run out of reserves you know, this is like you've been unemployed for too long. You're running out of money. Your bank account is dry. You don't have enough now to make it through the next month. Well, if you think of it from a physical standpoint, your your digestive system, your excretion system, and especially your immune system, there's no longer, you can't keep putting them on the back burner anymore without repercussions. And you can't keep pouring these into your body, um, adrenaline-wise, cortisol-wise, and resistance-wise. You can't fight that fight anymore. Your body just can't do it. So you go into the exhaustion phase. So in humans, the exhaustion phase in humans opens us up for the worst possible scenario, other than probably not, you know, probably not actually going to die, but it opens you up for psychophysiological illnesses. Now, psychophysiological illnesses is just a fancy way of saying stress-induced illnesses, which some researchers suggest that anywhere from 70 to 90% of your ailments are probably due by or exasperated by stress. Obviously, some are genetic and has nothing to do with stress, but many of the ailments that we suffer from are either caused by or contributed to or induced by stress-related things. Also, I would like to point out, chronic exposure to stress actually increases the aging process because it, it, it rapidly increases cell division and because of what you have, what on the end of your DNA called telomeres, once they run out, cells die. This actually speeds up telomere destruction and actually speeds up the aging process. So, but psychophysiological illnesses, look at all the different things that happen to you. And I promise all of you in here, you can find some in all four of these, like all four of these. You know, when you're under lots of stress, your body goes kaput, your thinking goes kaput, your behavior goes kaput, and your emotions go kaput. So everything about you, you know, starts to suffer. You start to suffer physical ailments a lot more. You get sick more often. You get ulcers. You get hypertension. You get migraines. You know, you have skin breakouts and acne. You're tired. Your body feels tired and weak all the time. Your mind, you start to be either your mind goes blank or you start, you know, having racing thoughts. You start have you start to worry. Uh, your, th your thinking becomes indecisive. It becomes irrational. You start having nightmares. Uh, there's a whole bunch of behavioral you know, changes as well. You, know, you may start to uh, exhibit um, bad behavior such as snapping on other people, um, being self-destructive, you know, uh, turning to drinking or drugs, uh, you know, not being able to sleep as much, um, you know, smoking more or vaping more, um, being more, uh, taking more risks. Uh, being more aggressive, being more isolated. There's so many things. And of course, emotions. You can become hyper emotional. You can become almost robotic in nature instead. You can become depressed. You can become irritable. You can become comp uh, consciously apprehensive. You become extremely angry, uh, very, very sad. You can lose confidence. You can lose motivation. 
Uh, you can become apathetic. I mean, there are so many things. And, and again, all of you can probably find all four of these hitting you at the same time again and again. All because that is not, stress was not designed to help us long-term, non-stop all the time. It was designed to get you through the problems, not through life that is nothing but a series of problems. And again, I do point out that the immune system is a heavy hitter here. And one, ex they've, they've done multiple experiments showing that the immune system and your immune system response to everyday things, and that's what they think often happens, is your immune system, you know, it's almost like the infrastructure in the United States. You know, we have been ignoring spending on infrastructure and so your immune system it takes a, it takes one for the team because of what you're fighting as stress now the immune system takes one for the team and is not being funded and it just opens up the door for you to then suffer from a whole slew of problems that stretch you out even more and they were probably caused by stress in the first place the rest of these uh, i would also point out almost all mental disorders are related in some way shape or form to stress related and anxiety inducing behaviors and then the last thing for this video, the number one thing that causes a stressor to be bad is not the size of the stressor. It's how much control somebody thinks they have. Now, just to be clear, the size of the stressor absolutely has an impact on how bad it will affect you. Let's please not try to compare you failing a quiz to somebody losing a loved one. However, what they have found is that if multiple people lose a loved one that they deeply care about, or if multiple people fail a quiz, or multiple people, you know, have a certain issue, so, okay, so they don't handle it all the same way. And there's a lot of reasons for that, but they, what they found is one of the most common reasons is control. The person who thinks they can handle it, they can endure it, they can persevere through it. They can learn from it. That is a huge factor. Because some of you know people that when something small happens to them, they go into catastrophe mode like it's the end of everything, and then they freak out and they panic, and you're like, what is this overreaction? It's not that big of a deal. Or you've got this. You can control this. As opposed to other people who, yes, they experience often the same number of stressors, but they're, they're like, I can do this. I can handle this. I've got this. I've got it under control. It's perceived control. Which brings me to this experiment right here. Uh, in one experiment, this was a control group. There were three groups of rats. One was the control group. They were never chopped. There were two other control groups. Or there were two other experimental groups. One were called the executive rats. They were trained to turn a wheel for food. And then later that wheel would be used to turn off electricity once the electricity started. And then there were subordinate rats that also were electrocuted, uh, but they were not trained on a wheel, so they had no, no way they could turn off um, the electroshock. So, and the control group rats were never shocked at all. So the control group rats, they lived their little lives, and then literally killed them, did a necropsy. Specifically, they were looking for ulcers, ulcers in the stomach lining. Then the executive rats, they were shocked, but as soon as the shock started, the executive rats learned they could turn off the shock by turning the wheel so they had control over stopping the shock. The control group, you know, never had any shock. The executive rats were shocked, but they could put it in its place and stop it. The subordinate rats could not stop the shock. They had to endure it. So then, after all three groups experienced this, they killed them, they necropsied them, they looked at their stomachs. What they found was, not shockingly, the control group rats didn't really show ulcers. Why would they? They didn't have any stress in their life. And ulcers are often associated with stress. The subordinate rats, not shocking me, most of them were riddled with ulcers because they were constantly under stress over and over and over and over again. So the executive rats, that's the interesting group. The executive rats as a whole did not seem, did not, they did not seem to show any more ulcers than that of the control rats. It was almost as if the executive rats had never been shocked at all. Well, the only explanation for this wasn't that they were, you know, exposed to a stressor. You know, the control group rats were not exposed to a stressor. The executive rats were exposed to a stressor. But the difference was, between the executive and subordinate rats, the executive rats 
could control the stressor. They could determine their fate. People who feel like their life is in their own hands and can control it and, and you've got it under control and can handle this, they don't have as much stress in terms of how they process it. Not in terms of their burdens, but they certainly can handle it better. So control so much of how you handle um, that is about control, which is why um, stress, uh, you know, for example, Han Celia, one of Han Celia's famous quotes is, it's not the stress that kills us. It's our reaction to it. We're all going to deal with stress. How you cope, how you react, how you perceive stress, how you view it from a control standpoint. If you feel like you're in control versus helpless, that's a huge factor. Another one says, uh, another famous uh, quote, and I can't remember who said this one, but um, the easiest way to deal with stress is to choose certain thoughts over others. And again, that is all about control, Pers like perceiving stress in the ways that make stress manageable, controllable, and therefore um, less harmful. Stress affects us. It's how you cope with it and how you perceive stress that has a lot to do with whether or not you'll be able to handle it. So that's it for this video. I will be building on some of the things I mentioned in this video in other videos about coping, uh, coping strategies and, and the types of people who are better or not better at coping. Uh, but that is going to be for a different video. So uh, this video, uh, as I said at the beginning, has a lot of videos in the description below that you might want to check out about this. Very fascinating. I think you'd find it very interesting and useful. Uh, if you have any questions or concerns about this, as always, please reach out for me. Otherwise, that is it for this video, and I will see you next time.